All right, hey guys. We are six feet apart with, with a longtime friend of mine, um, probably the black man in my life that I've known the very longest, since seventh grade, I think? Seventh or eighth grade, maybe? Yeah. We both, yep. went, to, we both went to school in Hilliard, and, um, and we played on the basketball team in eighth grade. And uh, this man has a really compelling story, and I've been chasing him down for a few weeks <laughs> trying to get this thing to happen because I want your story to be heard. All right. And uh, this is Latroy Rogers. Latroy, right. say hi to, yeah, nobody out hello, there, hello. but everybody out there. <laughs> um, we played basketball. You've got, uh, you live currently in Lewis Center area here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, let the viewers know who Latroy is. Um, again, I'm Latroy, and I currently. I'm in school right now to get my teaching degree uh, to teach to have a license in kindergarten through fifth grade. Uh, we moved to Lewis Center in 2009. We wanted diversity. We wanted somewhere where our kids could grow up and see um, just different people, experience different people, and have a very dynamic experience growing up with different types of people. And so we chose Lewis Center in 2008, and. Love it. Love it. So, you you chose Lewis Center for diversity. Um, tell tell us why that's important to you. you are you? Uh, you're, let's just say you're married to a white woman. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you guys have been married now for a longer than years. a decade. Yep. Congratulations. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and with that comes its own sets of crazy experiences, I'm sure. But before we jump into that, tell us a fun fact about. Latroy Rogers. Fun fact about Latroy Rogers. I think that I am the absolute most professional uh, singer in the world. And I am not. I okay. love to sing. I have no artistic, well, I have no music ability. My daughter teaches me, my son teaches me, and my wife teaches me. But I have no music ability. What's your favorite song to sing right now? Favorite song to sing right now is. Ooh, ooh, uh, The Rain by John Legend featuring Common. Okay, I'll have to listen to that one. Very good song, very Listen good song. to it, and then imagine somebody bad singing it, and that's probably what- It's me. What Troy is it's here. It's me. <laughs> All right, so you're married to a white woman. Yes, sir. What are some challenges that you guys have faced in the last 11 years of marriage, and then before that, dating? Yeah, um, a lot. Of, one of the biggest challenges, getting the looks. Right when we first started dating, we would go to Easton. And Easton was new at the time, and it was sprawling. There were, you could spend a lot of money there, you could spend a little bit of money. There are there lots of different um, socioeconomic classes that went to Easton, whether it was to window shop, purchase whatever you want to purchase. You could get shoes, clothes, whatever, furniture could go on a date there at a restaurant. We just went to walk around. We were young, we didn't have much money. It was just fun to walk around, go to a movie. While walking around together, we would get looks. I mean, we would get a lot of looks. We would get people to stop and stare. Wouldn't say anything out loud, just, just stop and stare. Look. Huh, never really seen that before. Um, another instance I can remember is when we were in Alabama, driving home from Florida. We pulled into a gas station and as we were pulling into the gas station, I was probably a foot away from stopping. So I was already in front of the pump. And we, a police officer came in and told us to get out of the car. So long story short, I got a ticket for driving without a seatbelt. So, um, and everyone else in the car, I was the only African American in the car, but it was my wife and two other of our friends who we went to Florida with. This was back in 2005. And uh, that was that was a, another wake-up call to me because when you leave your the, the area that you've been oppressed in or uh, hated on, you, you think you can get away from it, but you can't because it's it's always it's always going to be there. It's always going to be there. So that was that was another that was the wake-up call for me. Like racism is not going away. Just because my wife, or my Lissa, girlfriend at the time, we were able to date and overcome some things, but there was still a lot of ignorance out there. Yeah, so speaking of like, grow, growing up in Hilliard, um, 
you know, I saw it from through a different lens where I was definitely the majority. Mm -hmm. um, there were, I've said this in previous conversations, I could count the black people on two hands. Yeah. Um, and we played basketball with two or three, other, you know, really good guys. Everyone was a really good guy. Um, but you share with me uh, this last year some some encounters that you had growing up mm -hmm. in Hilliard, where we think oh, Hilliard's like Mayberry, right? Like yeah. it's it's not so it's not really Mayberry yeah. when you've encountered what you've encountered. Can you share a little bit about what you had to deal with? Of course, walking yeah. to school. We moved from the west side of Columbus. We lived behind uh, Weston Mall, and my dad was just he was ready to take us out of the inner city, Wait, ready to take us out of the bad area. So we left um, in the summer of me going into fifth grade. My dad told me about a school up the street. I go play basketball there. There's a basketball hoop or a basketball court in the neighborhood. So I'd walk, as soon as we moved to Hilliard, I lived in Avery Estates. So I'd walk from Avery Estates up to Avery uh, Elementary. And every day on my walk up to Avery Elementary, I was called a nigger almost every day. And it was, I mean, I had cans thrown at me, water bottles thrown at me um, three times while walking home, just dribbling the basketball. Um, I was pulled over by police. One time I was cuffed and put into the back of the cruiser. Um, that happened from fifth, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh, all the way up to I was a senior in high school. And I remember when I was in seventh grade, I was walking home from a friend's house on the, on the sidewalk. And I was arrested and they told me that they had reason to believe that uh, someone was in the area stealing items out of a car. I told the officer, I, my friend's house was right there, like not even 30 feet from me walking away. Like, there's no way that I could I could have the, enough time to do that and plus I, I don't need to do that because I don't live very far and I know a lot of people in this neighborhood so he said well we have a lot of people who made phone calls and said that they, they saw a black guy in this area taking stuff out of a truck so I was like can you tell me what street so he told me he told me the street and the street was a, was three streets over I don't know I don't know anyone on that street I had never walked on that street I knew where the street was but they didn't cuff me, and then he, he leaned over into my ear. He whispered, if you lie to me, I will pinch you. I know who you are. I know that you want to play basketball, but you will not play basketball. Put me in the back of the car, and then he and his partner, another officer who pulled up later, they just talked outside for about 30 minutes, and I just sat in the back of the cruiser, and then I got out of the, they, they let me out, and they told me again, if you are lying to me, we will pinch you in this town. So they uncuffed me and I walked home. I told my dad, I told my mom, and uh, they were very upset. But they also told me that being in an area like Hilliard, I'm gonna, I'm gonna experience those types of things and how I deal with those things will help me stay out of sticky situations. Fortunately, it happened quite a bit. So I would say, I, from fifth grade until I was a sophomore, I had been pulled over or cuffed in some way an average of three to four times a day. Most of those times were just walking home. Yeah, yeah. But I did not develop any hatred towards whites. How? Like, like how, man? Because like you're telling me this story, and I have hatred for white people, yeah. man. Like it's it is, it's just that's unreal. Yeah. I uh, I don't understand it because I've not I've never been cuffed. I've never put in the back been put in the back of a, a cruiser, especially not just walking home, especially not with a basketball in my hand, uh, just because I was born in the right uh, situation. Um, how, do you, how, how have you, I, I, so I've known this guy forever and he's always been the nicest, most even keeled person ever. And like, like reconnecting, I, I moved back to Columbus after 10 years in Cincinnati. We reconnected, like I saw you, I would see you in Walmart really, really consistently. I worked there for a while and 
Um, you're the kindest man. You're the best father. You are, are just loving. How do you get through being handcuffed and clearly mistreated to still like love your fellow man? Uh, my parents always told me not to go to that level, to speak up when I need to. And I spoke up. I spoke up when I needed to. But as a being young and being handcuffed, you're just you're scared out of your mind. There's, the only thing you want to do is just get out of that situation. Um, but as I got older, I made sure to 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 just be as level headed level headed as I could, um, and then just just look at everyone um, equally. And I, my mom always told me that she said, "Never never go to a level to where your heart will be misjudged." I did. Your parents and your grand grandmother did an amazing job. <laughs> amazing I will job. I will speak testimony to this man just being uh, a truly special person. Um, Likewise to you, sir. Well, no. Hopefully, like you out there in the audience can like learn something from this. Like we always want to end this conversation with something tangible that you can do, and uh, it's gonna be tough to replicate like the tangible things that his parents were able to convey to him. Um, but the least we can do is try, right? Like, try to love everybody regardless of their skin color, regardless of their socioeconomic class that you brought up earlier. Um, just to see people as people. Yeah, I definitely agree. So, you've told me your side of, you know, being married to a white woman. What's, what's Lissa's, like, has she run into, and I guess we could ask her in person eventually in the future, but what's, what's, what run-ins has she had with racism? Um, being the white end of the, the spectrum? Um, just being in places where I come by. Uh, like if she goes into a gas station and she's gonna go pick up something and I'm pumping gas, then I go in and meet her. I can see the, the looks that she gets almost immediately. Um, or if we're at a grocery store. Obviously not now, but when, before COVID happened, we were at a grocery store together and I would walk up to her and ask her a question, hey, do we need this? Or what do you think about adding this? The amount of stop and, the amount of stop and stares. It was just, it was just, it was just so many, it was just so many, so. Has, have you guys had the, conver I'm sure you had the conversation at least like when you started dating, like what it, how does that make you guys feel? Like, do you guys talk about the, the feelings or has it just at this point become, uh, hey, we're yeah. just gonna accept it and roll with it? We, you know what, we just try to, just, just we, I don't wanna say we roll with it, but we want our actions to speak louder than, than our words. And to see two people at the grocery store, just like everyone else at the grocery store, oh, we have that in common. We sure do. We both go to the grocery store. <laughs> we both get groceries. <laughs> so I feel like there. I feel like people have a hard time accepting change, and then accepting the change in the fact that we we have so much more in common, or we have this in common. That's a hard thing. That's a hard mindset to change, especially when you when you've had it for so long. So. Which is another reason why I moved to Lewis Center. Yeah, for those of you not familiar with Lewis Center, Lewis Center is probably one of the most diverse areas in the city, I'd say. I, you know, we were having a conversation before. Um, it's it's a melting pot through and through, so I would say blacks and whites. We might actually be approaching minority status in Lewis Center, <laughs> which is which is great because Columbus can can adopt all kinds of ethnicities and socioeconomic statuses, etc. Um, you've got children. Yes, sir. How's it been for them growing up with a black father and a white mother? Lots of questions, <laughs> um, but lots of good questions. Lots of moments for, as a parent, to re-educate ourselves on how we convey information to our kids. And what I mean, not by sugarcoating it, by telling them the truth. Uh, I know my daughter has experienced things like she's been called a spork before because it was a mix of a spoon and a fork equivocating it to a biracial person. Um, the amount
amount of people who just want to walk up and touch her hair and play with her hair. That's another thing. It's like, what do you, I know you like my hair, but I don't want you to touch it. I don't touch your hair. Um, one of the biggest conversations that we have is about the perception of African Americans in entertainment. Um, with rap and sports, it's predominantly African American. But when you watch TV, when you watch commercials, there aren't that many African Americans in TV or in commercials, etc., etc., etc. So we've had conversations like, why, why aren't there more people that look like me? We've had those conversations. Um, we've also had conversations about why some of her friends have spoken about the Black Lives Matter movement, some of the things that they said, and it's a matter of not having enough information to, to understand it. And I read, I read a really good quote earlier today. You can have the knowledge of something, but it doesn't mean you understand it. So I feel like as parents, we need to make sure that our kids have the knowledge of something and they understand it. And I feel like moving forward as a whole in America, people need to do a better job. Everyone needs to do a better job of make, not only having that knowledge, but making sure that everyone has the understanding. That's, that's good. That's really good stuff there. How have things this past month been for you and your family? For our family, it's, 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 it's been a little crazy with all the lockdown stuff, but... Uh, More just, specifically, since the George Floyd incident happened. Um, we have been, we've been good. We've had a lot of conversations. Um, the, a lot of the conversations have, have been, why do black people get looked at that way? Why do black people get treated that way? And those are some conversations that are, my son is eight, that's, that's rough for him to hear. And he'll look at me and ask me, well, will that happen to you? And I'm like, well, I hope not, but you, you don't know. But this is how I would, this is how I would react in this situation. Um, same with Kyra, Kyra's about, she's about to drive. Um, she has other African American friends, so I, you know, I have to tell her, like, listen, when you're in the car and you're with your friends, you're going to be looked at in a certain way. So this is how you're going to have to react. These are the things you're going to have to do to not be perceived as criminal. Um, those are hard conversations because your kids, your kids looking at you and they're saying, why would they look at me as a criminal? I'm not a criminal. I know, but the perception of being criminal. That is another mindset that we have to make sure that we try and fight with our actions, but we to use positive actions when we do that. Speak up for yourself when you need to. Yeah, that's got to be uh, that's got to be super hard because you're 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 a man. You mm -hmm. can handle uh, the questions. Yeah. But an eight-year-old kid, like, come on, man. Like right. we're. Um, we're asking children these days to to grow up a little quicker than 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 we did. Yeah. Uh, it's not fair to them, but at the same time, like I guess, what's the positives that can come out of something so negative? Mm -hmm. And my hope, I guess, would be change, right? All right. Um, you know, I know you you follow sports because we grew up in it. Yeah. Like <laughs> just what's happening in NASCAR right yeah. now. Like for those of you who don't follow. Um, uh, NASCAR, in my opinion, would probably be the most hillbilly racist sport out there, right? And I actually, I, I've been to races and stuff, and they're fun. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a there's an African American driver, and uh, he's called for uh, the banning of the Confederate flag, which is probably long overdue. I mean, if you think of what that flag stands mm -hmm. for, and so NASCAR went ahead and did it, and now he's getting you know all kinds of death threats and stuff. Yeah. But people are standing behind him. The entire racing community like race car drivers are standing behind him and it's pretty amazing to see that in the course of two weeks a humongous change has taken effect over a sport that at its you know roots are right yeah you know, fundamentally um you know there's there's been a lot of racism in the past so uh it's been incredible to see some change there it's yeah. been incredible to have conversations where in the past we felt uncomfortable maybe having them those conversations um 
I'm just glad there's folks like you who are willing to have the conversation and uh, I know it's it's probably not comfortable necessarily just talking about the vulnerability of being a black man or mm-hmm. woman in this society in this day and age especially um, but hopefully like you referenced earlier understanding coming from the knowledge like I think this helps hopefully yeah it definitely helps myself like understanding what what it is you're going through and what list is going through and your kids are going through to hopefully instill some change in what I'm doing as a parent or in the light that I'm being to others at the workplace, at the grocery store. And um, you know, seeing one, one man do an amazing job of, of being a, a black man or being a man, just a man, right? We take the, take the labels off. Uh, hopefully we'll inspire others to, to be a light as well. So thank you. Last question, and you, I think you maybe answered this, and you know, um, in your opinion, what are some things like that we can do, like that I could do as a white man, to to better our relationship between blacks and whites? Um, I think the first thing would be. So I say to him, I, I tell Braden and Kaya, remember that you are more than a stereotype. So we say that. I'm more than a stereotype. So my question to others would be, are you more than your stereotype of people? And I say that because if you look around, if you look around at businesses, do you see other African Americans? Do you see other Native Americans? Do you see other Indian Americans? Do you see other people who look different that could that would contribute the same amount of workforce, efficiency, start, start, start. Um, Are those people in positions of management? Um, If you look at at the White House and politics, same thing. We have a very small percentage of African Americans, very small percentage of Asian Americans, Chinese Americans, uh, Japanese Americans who are in political seats. I think the whole, the, the landscape of America is slowly changing, but it's changing with certain rules. And I think that as a whole, if we take a look at what needs to be changed and how we can make that change, I think I think we'll be in a better place. Really good stuff, man. And uh, I, uh, again, the reason I want to talk to you is because of your, your family makeup and you have something that's unique to to you and your story that you have to tell is awesome and hopefully it's been powerful for you it's been powerful for me squinting out here and uh, (laughs) hey we got we got to be safe uh, because his wife has some health concerns and we want to make sure that we're covid safe here so thank you for taking the time thank you for coming by sir man i uh i hope that hopefully off of this i guess the tangible go do is that we could instill in ourselves is Take a look in the mirror and um, are you love, I guess, is the question. Like, look, as you were talking about your reaction, like, are you, are you being loving towards others? And show it through your actions, not through your words, because your words are meaningless in a lot of situations. Mm-hmm. But are you producing actions of love, like, like his parents and his grandmother instilled in him to not be reactionary? So, um, you know, not say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. It's just... Uh, taking it and and turning it around and and being a light to others I think is super important it sounds very reminiscent of people that are strong in their faith and uh, I'm sure that you are that so thank you I have a lot of faith in the future because of people like you thank you thank you love you man talk to you later boom all right thanks guys